I don't know if there are many vegans left in the audience after that talk. So uh, today is a stressful day for me. I'm going to be speaking. So have a little bit of a cheering squad. Is, is there anybody from nurses from Clear Lake CCU? Um, I think that a conference like this uh, brings people from different disciplines. Uh, there are endocrinologists in this audience. There is a CV surgeon, family physicians. Uh, there were endocrinology fellows in this audience. And the reason I think that it is important is physicians need to learn from Peter. And they especially need to learn from Amber, who's going to come up here next. And Amber is a particularly smart individual and I cannot tell you how much I have learned from uh, her and how much of that information I have translated into my own clinical practice. She analyzes things very differently, very differently than a physician would. And all of us put together a team of experts from different disciplines is going to improve human health. So with that, I want Amber to come up here and give her a plant versus carnivore diet talk. Okay. The title of my talk, plant-based or carnivore, what's the best for mTOR? rhymes and it inspired me to write the whole talk in verse, which I didn't do. <laughs> but how many of you would like to hear some mTOR poetry? <laughs> okay, well maybe later. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to talk about mTOR for a couple of reasons. One is that it comes up as a question to me very often. Uh, a concern about low carb and especially meat heavy diets that this might be activating mTOR and thus undoing some potential health benefits. And at the same time, the other side of that coin is that uh, very often I'll see plant-based advocates talking about how their diet, because of its low protein, is actually much better for mTOR. And so I wanted to shed some light on that. mTOR is a complex biochemical phenomenon and I also have the goal to simplify things uh, just enough to the point that we'll get what's really important here. I hope I achieve that. So let's start with a little bit of history. Um, well, the reason that mTOR is considered so important is because we have a lot of information now that it seems to be very connected to how the aging process works, and longevity is a universal human desire, I think. Uh, I don't really have to argue for that point. Um, so what is mTOR? mTOR stands for mammalian, although uh, sometimes now we call it mechanistic, target of rapamycin. So I'm going to talk about where that name came from, why we call it that, and what that means. So it all started in Easter Island. The, in the native tongue there, it's called Rapa Nui. And in the 60s, there was a Canadian expedition to take soil and plant samples to study them. And after uh, they finally got around to studying the samples in the soil, they found that there was this very potent uh, ant oops, antifungal. And so uh, rapa means from Rapa Nui, and mycies is the word for mushroom or fungus, and side is a killer. So uh, rapa mycin means the antifungal from Rapa Nui. That's all there is to that. But enthusiasm, enthusiasm started to wane when we discovered that it not only was it a potent antifungal, but a potent immunosuppressant. And most or many cases where we want an antifungal, you don't actually want to be suppressing the immune system. Although that did start to get used uh, fruitfully for kidney transplants later. Not only is it a potent antifungal and a potent immune suppressant, but it's also a potent growth suppressant. Um, so we started to get really excited about that uh, when we started to notice that that was true of cancer cells as well. So this is 
a timeline of discoveries related to rapamycin and mTOR. The, the way that we found out about mTOR itself was that we took rapamycin and killed some yeast with it and, no, and took the, the yeast that survived and said, what's wrong with them that rapamycin didn't kill them? Uh, this is actually Michael Hall, one of the primary investigators who found out about this, giving, giving a talk about it. And uh, he told us that the, the yeast that survived all had genetic mutations in a particular part of the gene, uh, which they just didn't have a name yet, so they called it the target of rapamycin, which is TOR. So that's all that name means. And then um, the human, uh, the mammalian analog for the yeast is where the M comes from. So there was a point where we didn't know whether the growth suppression had to do with the size of the cells or the number of cells. It turns out it's both, but um, the size part was found out in a really interesting way. It turns out that fruit flies, their wings are actually only one cell wide. And so you could actually count them. And when they found out that you could make a smaller fruit fly by suppressing tor, uh, the, then they could compare and find out that it's actually the same number of cells, just smaller. But things got really exciting when we found out that this was actually involved in aging as well. And that's when TOR and mTOR studies really started taking off. So what does it mean that it controls aging? Well, you can think of mTOR as an on-off switch. In case you care, the, the switch is, is a protein kinase, but that doesn't really matter for the purposes of this talk. You can think of it as turning something on or turning it off. And uh, the thing that it's turning on or off has to do with the phases of metabolism. Uh, there are basically two phases, and there are many different names for these phases depending on what your specific interest is, but catabolic and anabolic are pretty good names for them. So there's a phase where you're breaking things down, and then there's a phase where you're building things up. I like to call it the energy and the matter phase because in the catabolic part, you're actually taking your own structure and stores and you're turning matter into energy. And when you're building things up, you're using that energy and materials to build yourself more. mTOR is, the, is activated in the build phase. So that's what that's about. So if you want to ask, how do you inhibit mTOR, it's really the same question as how do you activate the energy phase. And there are many ways that you can activate the energy phase. You can do this by fasting or caloric restriction. You can do it with glucose restriction or protein restriction. And there's an important detail about that, that you can do either. It doesn't have to be both. And that seems to be where a lot of the confusion is. You can do it through exercise. You can also do it through things that taste bitter, which is almost always an indication that there are toxins, because toxins and other forms of oxidative stress put you into the energy mode. So all of this comes back to the theme that anything that creates an energetic demand or a poor nutritional environment will put you into the energy phase. Another way of looking at it is through the hormonal signals. You may have heard of the insulin to glucagon ratio. Uh, when that gets low, you get into the energy phase. And this is, yes, that same hormonal signal that controls ketogenesis. If you're going to be ketogenic, you have to get insulin down relative to glucagon. OK. so mTOR is the switch that turns on the build phase. What about the energy phase? It turns out there's another switch called AMPK. AMPK will turn on the energy phase. And AMPK and mTOR are kind of fighting for who's dominant. Uh, so AMPK and mTOR act uh, opposite each other, kind of like a yin-yang balance thing. <clears throat> 
AMPK is an energy sensor. So you might know about ATP being a way that, we, a kind of energetic currency that we use. You might not have heard of AMP. Generally, AMP is what's left over when you're using ATP. And um, so there's this kind of cycling back and forth of using ATP, getting AMP out, and then you can remake it into AMP later. Um, the main controls for that have to do with glucose and fat. So when you're in a high glucose state, this enables you to make a lot of ATP. And that suppresses AMPK. Now, high fat, of course, also allows you to make a lot of ATP, but there's another uh, important fact about high fat. The more circulating fat you have, the more uh, it raises AMP through a different pathway. And so in balance, if you look at the amount of AMP compared to ATP, uh, you'll have more AMP. And that's the signal that AMPK is looking for. It says, how much ATP do you have compared to AMP? So the, the sum of this knowledge is that when glucose is high, your AMPK is suppressed. And when fat is high uh, and glucose is low, then AMPK is activated. All right, so that brings us to the question of whether or not a carnivore diet actually inhibits mTOR. Well, the fact is anything that's ketogenic activates the energy phase. And the reason for that is because in order to get energy from fat, you have to be in the energy phase. It's, it's almost tautological. But then the question that people keep coming to me with is, what about protein? Doesn't protein disrupt ketosis and therefore disrupt the energy phase and therefore activate mTOR? And the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so one way of looking at this is through the lens of ketogenesis. So one thing that we know about mTOR is if mTOR is activated, ketogenesis is suppressed. And that means that if mTOR is activated, then ketogenesis is suppressed. So it's just another way of saying it, right? So that means if there's ketogenesis, what does that say about mTOR? It must be. It must be inhibited. <laughs> okay, so this ties into something that I talked about here last year a little bit, and I've investigated a lot, actually, and that's that Ketosis works differently in different species. So up on the left, we have animals that we know often go into long fasting phases, the bear when it hibernates or the camel. And it turns out that these animals, much to my surprise when I learned about it, actually don't use ketogenesis in those fasting phases. They have biochemical pathways that, turn that prevent that from happening. Um, down at the bottom there, we have migrating birds. They do use ketogenesis very efficiently, but only when they're migrating in that fasting period. So they're, all, they're, they're the ultimate ketogenic athletes. They get really fat when they're on land, and then they switch into a ketogenic mode for migration. The animals up on the top right are carnivorous. So you might think, oh, well, they'll definitely be in ketosis, but it turns out they're not. Uh, cats, for example, when, when they start to fast, they, they can't really turn off gluconeogenesis. They really want to stay in this glucose mode. That's what they're physiologically adapted for. And so even though they will make some ketones, it's actually not very good for them. They'll develop fatty liver. Dolphins, on the other hand, have a genetic mutation that prevents ketogenesis from even happening. The ones that are most like us are dogs and rodents. But, but <laughs> even those uh, don't do ketogenesis quite the way we do. So a dog, for example, if you want a dog to be in ketosis, you either have to restrict their calories and or protein or give them a lot of exercise or feed them MCT oils. Otherwise, they're just not going to be in ketosis. And the same is almost true with rodents. Rodents, you can get them on a ketogenic ad libitum diet that has just enough protein, but if you give them even a tiny bit more, they're automatically out. And even when those animals are in ketosis, they, they just don't get into it as deeply as we do even when they're fasted. So humans have this really fascinating and unique ability to, to get into ketosis even though 
they ha are eating protein. And uh, I've talked about that in, for in more depth previously. Uh, it, I think it has a lot to do with the many changes that we went through over the course of our evolution from when we were a, a more uh, her herbivorous animal, basically. And But you can also see this in studies when you look at epilepsy, for example. It's been shown that uh, definitely you can get in ketosis and have therapy if you're eating just enough protein, uh, or maybe even slightly too little. <laughs> um, but it's been found that even if you use a diet with ad libitum protein, having 30% or even more sometimes of your calories coming from protein, for most people that doesn't put them out of ketosis and it doesn't stop the therapeutic benefit. So humans are special that way. All right, what about a plant-based diet? Does it inhibit mTOR? Well, anything that restricts protein activates the energy phase. And it's a little bit of a funny way of saying it. Um, but here's a, here's a paper from my favorite journal, which is Medical Hypotheses. I love this journal because what it allows is for people who don't necessarily have the experiments that they would need to prove an idea, but they've got an idea based on the literature uh, about how something might work, and they have a chance to expand upon it so that it can pave the way for further research. This is a plant-based advocate, McCarty, who's talking about vegan proteins, and he's saying that the proteins that we use in vegan diets actually might reduce, re reduce our risk of these various diseases through promoting increased glucagon activity. That's interesting. <laughs> Um, I wasn't able to, f to get access to the original paper, but there's a paper that McCarty discusses in that paper, uh, which is here by uh, Deskovich from 1982. And what they did was they took some people on an arm omnivorous, low-fat diet, and all they changed was where the protein was coming from, so from animal-based protein to soy. And what they saw was glucagon went up and insulin went down, and so their, their glucagon to insulin ratio went up, or in other words, their insulin to glucagon ratio went down. And McCarty expounds on the wonderful benefits that you can get by lowering your insulin to glucagon ratio, and so everybody should be eating a vegan diet. <laughs> I guess he doesn't know that ketogenesis does that. Um, and, and the reason why has to do with essential proteins. So he talked a lot about how the vegan diet has a much higher proportion of non-essential proteins compared to essential proteins. And, and that, of course, suppresses mTOR because your body's not going to put you in the build mode if you don't have enough materials to build. There's just no reason to go there. OK, so now we can ask the parallel question. If you're on a vegan diet, doesn't the fact and, oh, and I should have uh, specified this, of course you can do a ketogenic plant-based diet, but what I'm talking about mainly here is the high-carb plant-based normal version of the diet. Um, so if you're on a high-carb plant-based diet, doesn't carbohydrate increase your insulin and disrupt your energy mode and activate mTOR? Well, yes and no. <laughs> it depends on exactly what you're doing. Um, but because of that, well, insulin is well established to activate mTOR. That's, that's really not a question. There are many steps that come in between, but insulin is going to do that. Um, so because of that, if you're on a plant-based diet, what you really have to do if you want to get these benefits of the energy mode consistently is go, go on some kind of a fast. So this company, Prolon, uh, comes out of Walter Longo's work. Longo is one of, if not the most prominent researcher on the benefits of fasting. He knows all about how the ketogenic metabolism in, uh, inhibits mTOR and induces autophagy and does all these wonderful regenerative things that we want. However, because he believes that a high-carb plant-based diet is the healthiest diet, he would never advocate for doing that all the time. So instead, what you have to do is periodically do these long fasts. They have to be five days because it takes a long time before you even get to the autophagy phase. And so his company, Prolong, has provided a way for you to fast by buying their kits in which you eat uh, these packets of very low-protein um, very low calorie and um, 
glucose, but not enough when you eat only what's provided to enable you to get ketogenic by now. <laughs> Another way that a plant-based diet is sometimes believed to help with inhibiting mTOR has to do with phytochemicals. And I really didn't mean to pick on individual people and blogs, but this blog had such a perfect picture, and, and it encapsulates the whole um, scientifically overturned idea that the, the compounds in, in plants are providing antioxidation, which could help with longevity. So the, the idea used to be that you have too much oxidation in your body, and therefore, if we provide plants that have known antioxidant compounds in them, you can overcome that oxidation and thereby increase your lifespan. It is wrong for a couple of reasons. First of all, phytochemicals are xenobiotic. Xeno means foreign, right? And, and so the body, as soon as you see these phytochemicals, it says, hey, this is not, this is not something that we recognize we don't want it in our body, and therefore we do everything we, do no, we can do not to absorb it. So basically almost all of phytochemicals are excreted as soon as possible. The second thing is oxidation, ROS stands for reactive oxi oxi oxidation species, reactive oxygen species, and usually when you see it in a paper, It'll be in this big BAM star, <laughs> like, look out, oxidation, trouble. <laughs> uh, but we actually know that oxidation is a powerful, important signal. And as long as everything's working correctly, it's not actually something that's causing a problem. It can run rampant, but it normally doesn't. So this is a, a cartoon of the electron chain transport system and we don't really need to understand the details of it but just notice that whenever you're making energy in your mitochondria you are also making oxidation and for a while i think we, we considered this a leak <laughs> as if like billions of years of evolution on our energy making systems made the mistake of of get, giving all this garbage at the same time but actually it's it's an important signal because the more energy you're making, the more of this oxygenation you're making, and that quantitatively tells the cell a, a status of how much energy you have. And so, in other words, uh, the more oxidation you have, uh, when you have enough, you will become insulin resistant. Now here's the point where I might lose everybody for a second, but stay with me. Insulin resistance is actually good at the level of the cell because what it's saying is I don't need any more fuel I'm satiated and we all need our bodies to be satiated at certain points so the oxidation goes up it says you've got enough energy please don't let in any more glucose we're good and this is actually self-perpetuating because if you've got a cell and it's turned off uh, the ability to take in more glucose by becoming insulin resistant, but you have a lot of free fatty acids circling around, those can come into the cell. And as long as you're using those, you're generating more uh, oxidation and you'll stay insulin resistant as long as there are fatty acids available. So if you're on a ketogenic diet, this is basically your perpetual state. This is physiological insulin resistance. It's completely reversible. As soon as the fatty acids go away, uh, you will again open up and be available to take glucose. Um, and of course, though, we've got that ox uh, the oxidation. And so AMPK sees that and says, oh, by the way, we've also got to turn off that signal now, so it, it tells you to make your own endogenous, that means in the body, antioxidants. And so the oxidation is created, and then you, you make an antioxidant response, and everybody's happy. Um, another source of oxidation, though, can come from plant-derived compounds. For example, nicotine, or sulforaphane, or resveratrol, uh, curcuminoids, quercetin, all of these work not <laughs> by giving you antioxidants, but by creating a toxic oxidation effect 
And your body in response to that stimulus says, oh, okay, we're going to turn up AMPK and get in the energy mode. And also we're going to ramp up our own supply of antioxidants. So there are some cases actually where you can use a little stimulus of a poison and, and give that uh, to your body and it will make more antioxidants that, than needed to overcome that stimulus. And that might actually be able to mop up some uh, rampant oxidation and, and be good in that case as well. Um, this is actually the title of a paper, Come to Where Insulin Resistance Is, Come to AMPK County, uh, Country. <laughs> uh, it's talking about how uh, nicotine actually works by ramping up AMPK, which then uh, generates uh, or allows you to burn fat, lipolysis. So uh, it's well known, right, that smoking and, and nicotine can cause you to lose weight, and it's a problem when you try to quit. And they're talking about how this... Well, it lowers your body fat, but it also creates insulin resistance. And I think they might be a little bit confused about whether that insulin resistance is good or bad. But in this case, it's just giving you fatty acids, and so it's probably good. Um, of course, smoking uh, gives you more sources of oxidation and might be overkill. We've always got to, we've got to be really careful with our doses when we're doing something exogenously. But this is actually the same principle that all of these other factors use. So you may have heard that sulforaphane is a, is a superfood um, compound in resveratrol. All of them work through AMPK. Um, and I just want to note, though, but this isn't an argument for getting those compounds from food, because the amounts that are involved are just way beyond what you could get from eating a plant-based diet. Uh, here, this is just one paper that was giving an example of resveratrol. How much red wine would you have to eat to get enough resveratrol to get a therapeutic dose? Um, somewhere between 500 and 3,000 liters. It's more than even I could do. <laughs> The same, the same uh, arguments are made for uh, sulforaphane. It's not, you're not going to get it from, just from broccoli sprouts. Um, so insofar as plants are inducing this energy mode, they're doing it through pharmacological doses, not through just eating plants. And it's not because of antioxidation. It's actually because of oxidation. Uh, and when we isolate antioxidants and see if that helps, actually we find that it's, it does things we really, really don't want. So exer doing exercise, for example, creates oxidation that is used as a signal that tells us to build our muscles. And if you give too much uh, antioxidation from the outside, it shuts off that signal and you don't get the benefit. Uh, that's because it comes from this mitochondrial signal. Um, so because of that, um, there, there are times when we need to build up. And this is a paper that's called uh, Intermittent Metabolic Switching. And the theory that they're trying to explain in this paper is that there are two modes, like we've already talked about, and you actually really need both of them to be healthy. So you might hear a lot about how the energy mode, when you're in ketosis or when you're fasting, you get all this stimulus for autophagy, and you get, for example, an increase in uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That is something that's telling your body, hey, we need to make more neurons. And, and there's all, all kinds of parallel stimuli for things that we need to make. But what might be missed when we talk about this is that that building doesn't actually happen until you go back into the building mode and give yourself the material to follow through and make those ne neurons and make the, that protein and, and make those synapses. So these things have to work together. You can't have just one without the other and expect to get benefit. Um, so you need to have mTOR. You need it for your muscles. You need it for your brain growth. Um, here, just to put a finer point on it, this was an experiment, and there are several such, where they took gerbils and gave them rapamycin to continuously inhibit mTOR, and they actually couldn't form long-term memories. You, you don't want that, because you need the protein synthesis to make those synapses that make the memories form. 
I really like this graphic. I stole it from Keir Watson from, and, and Afifa Hamilton, who have this great blog called Rosemary Cottage Clinic. And in this blog post, they were talking about how pre-agriculture, we would naturally probably have these feasting and fasting modes. And they talk about how if you're stuck in the feasting mode all the time, you can end up with problems of diseases of civilization. And then if you don't have enough food, you end up resorting to eating plants that are bitter. And that if you're stuck there for a long time, then you're going to end up with toxicity and malnutrition and maybe even starvation. So let's talk about the relative advantages of high-carb uh, plant-based diets and low-carb meat-based diets with respect to inhibiting mTOR. So the first thing is, how long does it take you to get into the energy mode? If you're on a high-carb plant-based diet, it's going to take you three to four days to really get there. If you're on a low-carb, even if you're meat-based, you're already keto-adapted. I, I would suggest that it takes less than a full day of not eating before you're already in this mode that it takes three days to get to from a high-carb diet. And um, I'll just show a diagram, uh, a real old diagram from Cahill where he's talking about the different modes of eating. And so you've just eaten and now you've got uh, these different phases you have to go through before you can get to the energy phase. So there's the absorptive phase where you're actually dealing with all the glucose that you just ate. And it's not until that's over that you can start working on the post-absorptive phase where you're depleting your glycogen. And then you finally get to the energy mode and start being able to get benefits. Um, so I would suggest that if you're eating a, a low carb, even if it's a high meat diet, the space of time between getting there, even though I don't have a quantitative value for you, has got to be shorter. Um, we could talk about lipid profiles. I, I think that all the information that you've been hearing here will give you a good basis to decide for yourself whether you think low, ADL, low LDL and low HDL is a better profile than high LDL and high HDL. So I won't say more about that. There are nutritional sustainability uh, issues. So if, if you're necessarily going to eat a diet that's low in essential proteins, um, that could be a sustainability problem. I didn't have a chance to talk about meat-based bioactives. What I mean by that are just conditionally essential nutrients like taurine and carnitine and carnosine, which uh, we don't pay much attention to because we're able to synthesize them ourselves, but the amount that we need is probably more than that rate that we do synthesize them. Evolutionarily, we're probably made to expect to get some of that from our food. Um, a low-carb meat-based diet might be low in phytochemicals, do we care? I don't care. Um, <laughs> are we sufficiently going to get into the growth mode? Well, this is where I think the, the advantages and disadvantages really stand out. Because if you're, eating, if you're constantly eating a, a diet that's low in essential proteins, um, you're going to risk that sarcopenia and, and brain compromise. Whereas if you're eating a low-carb meat-based diet, you're frequently going to get into that growth phase. Um, and that growth phase is important. As Peter mentioned, if we're talking about longevity, if this whole thing is about longevity, what do we know about longevity? This is just an association, but I think there's actually something to it. Um, your body composition matters. Muscle mass probably matters for wh uh, how likely you are to live a long life. Okay, so I threatened you with poetry. Here is an ode to mTOR. Inhibiting mTOR is all the rage because it's thought to control the effects of age. Rapamycin was our first clue when we started to notice what it really could do. Two basic modes work in alternation, creative destruction and self-augmentation. mTOR is active in the building up phase. To inhibit mTOR, there are various ways. Depletion of protein is one well-known way, but another is through raising AMPK. AMPK senses low HTP. Low glucose and high fat is the key. A nuance we might accidentally miss, ketosis itself is a marker for this. While too much protein might kick you out, ketosis with protein is what humans are about. <laughs> 
Protein restriction can get you some distance, but if insulin's high, there'll be mTOR persistence. Once thought to cause aging, we see oxidation as the signal that instigates rejuvenation. Trying to fix it with exogenous infusions quickly corrected our mistaken conclusions. But toxins from plants can enhance oxidation in high enough doses of mass infiltration. While working toward this, we shouldn't forget chronic inhibition will leave us in debt. mTOR activation is crucial for growth, meaning muscles and neurons. We really need both. A healthy system should alternate. How often, how long depends on what we ate. Depletion of glycogen takes many an hour, but more if your last meal was sugar and flour. If it's three days of fasting before autophagy starts, then surely it's less if you're skipping the tarts. In this way, the carnivore has an advantage. It makes hitting both phases easy to manage. The vegan can do it with much longer fasting, but might face health risks if low protein is lasting. We must keep in mind if longevity is the goal, protection of lean mass may well play a role. There are multiple ways we can hack our mTOR, so it needn't be part of the meat or plants war, but strategies differ. So if you would try it, remember the trade-offs of your favorite diet. That was simply incredible, paradigm shifting. I hope all the physicians in the audience recognize that, including the vegans. <laughs>